Let's play another game. What do Bill Gates, B.B. King, John Mayer, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Ellison, and Steve Jobs have in common? They're all dropouts, and yet they're considered the best in class in what they do. Furthermore, Gates and Zuckerberg both dropped out of Harvard, which, in light of the recent unfortunate events in the Middle East, finds itself in a spiraling news cycle, which is costing Harvard tons and tons of financial backers and the students job placement opportunities. Now, Bill Ackman of Pershing Square, major hedge fund guy in New York City, kind of got this ball rolling. I'm not here to judge one way or the other. I think violence is despicable. I'm all about peace. Uh, but then quickly you saw Larry Summers, other Harvard alums, um, you know, Davis Polk started rescinding job offers, big prominent law firm, uh, even Leslie Wexner, who you're only supposed to know for being the founder of Victoria's Secret. Instead, you probably have heard of him for giving Jeffrey Epstein a $70 million townhouse just for free. So what's up with all this? I think America was finally forced to confront the pervasive ideological capture that exists in our educational system. By now, you've probably seen all those docs trucks rolling around Harvard's campus displaying the names and the faces of all the students that signed those letters, which I'm not saying isn't justifiable or anything like that, but it does beg the question, like, how did we get here? To me, something like this seems unconscionable just three to four years ago, like, doesn't it? It also reminds me of a wild interview that makes its rounds on the internet from 1984, where a Russian KGB spy confesses to how they infiltrate the minds of younger generations through their school systems. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. Crazy, right? So like all my videos, we're gonna solve the world's problems. In this particular video, we're gonna examine the following. Number one, is America's educational system ideologically captured, fundamentally broken, or at best, just outdated and overpriced given all the technological advancements that we have in this day and age of freely available information? Number two, what alternatives are there? And number three, what can you or your kids do going forward? Let's get into it. Do you know how much the cost of college has risen since 1980? Cost of college is up 880% for in-state colleges. Private universities, that's 923%. Harvard is up 795%. And to give you a little context, since 1980, houses are up only 675% and cars only about 640%. And right now you're probably saying, bro, we get it. We've had a full year of inflation talk. We got it, it's good. But here's the problem, my friends. Since 1980, income only rose 458%. And that magic trick is called pricing power. And all that means is how much can someone jack their prices without losing a marginal amount of customers? Got it? Good. And what other goods and services come to mind that have high pricing power? You got diamonds, Rolexes, Ferraris, Hermes Birkin bags, or even exclusive golf country club memberships. The universities, especially Ivy League institutions, have the same hallmark features. Controlled supply, exclusivity, and status. Where universities differ, however, is how they're financed, regulated, and taxed. And this speaks to where the fix is sort of in. Some go so far as to call it a monopoly at this point. Let's start with the financing aspect. Who holds your school loan? It's not Goldman Sachs. It's not Bill Ackman from Pershing Square. They have no confidence in your ability to repay that loan. They want nothing to do with it. No, it's the government via Sally May, which essentially provides regulatory blocking and tackling for these universities to keep raising their prices because they don't have to play by the same rules of capitalism like a normal company would. And universities are like, gee, thanks, Uncle Sam, and just keep raising prices. Did you know for every dollar the government lends out, universities raise their tuition on average by about 60 cents? And don't forget, student debt is the one loan that will follow you to your grave. The government will finance your debt, but filing for bankruptcy is conveniently just off the table. How's that for regulatory capture? And what's the result? Skyrocketing tuition and diminishing educational enrichment. Nobody's competing. Essentially, in today's technologically driven society that magically produces more for less, education has managed to provide less for more. Consider Harvard's approach during COVID, where everything was Zoom-based and they refused to discount tuition. That makes no logical sense, and some parents even filed class action lawsuits. But Harvard stuck to their guns and they basically just said, hey, you get that Harvard stamp of approval, you're golden. And that's despite the unprecedented times of a global pandemic, but students weren't able to get that value of networking with other students or alums or professors. Essentially, you're saying, this is how we do it because this is how we've always done it. 
and there's no discussion. And that kind of mindset leads to the death of innovation. It also flies directly in the face of first principles thinking, which is what Elon is using to transform sustainable energy, space exploration, and even education. More on that in a bit. And just a side note, this is an even bigger deal because it's October 2023 and the moratorium on COVID era student loan repayment is officially over. Oh, back to school, back to school. Did you know the average monthly student debt payment is currently $284 for bachelor students and $584 for master students. And this may finally put added pressure on the consumer. We already saw last week from LVMH's earnings that luxury goods sales are down. And I just finished this massive 600 plus page Elon Musk biography. And there's a couple of mantras in here that I think stand out and can be informative on how to approach this whole educational issue. And number one is question everything. There's a lot of interviews with Steve Jobs talking about the same sort of thing. Even B.B. King and John Mayer, the way they approach the guitar, it's always about learning the thing beneath the thing that you like. Uh, Steve Jobs talks about poking something and something else pops out and that everything around us is just designed by somebody else that's no smarter than you. So why not you? Why can't it be you who designs the next thing? Number two is delete, delete, delete. And throughout the book, you get a ton of examples of Elon just savagely seeking to cut out fat through design, through workforce, through processes, and using this first principles thinking to be able to compete with the military industrial complex, with the auto industry, that's just been basically milking the US government with cost plus pricing for decades and decades, resulting in wasted tax dollars and inferior products and services. I did a little digging beyond the book to find out more about Elon's approach to education. And he basically bought Gene Wilder's mansion, then recruited a local fourth grade teacher to develop this entire curriculum for his children and some of the children from people at SpaceX and just in the nearby neighborhood. Think Montessori on steroids. I can already hear a lot of you saying, yeah, you know, it must be nice to be a billionaire, but I think that's missing the point just a little bit, and I'll tell you why. In just a second, we'll look at affordable and even free courses from Harvard online that you could use and that I've used to learn how to code. And by the way, I know Elon's a controversial figure, so let me provide another example by way of Jon Stewart, who got that same stench of corruption and waste with the military industrial complex when they couldn't account for $850 billion in the budget. An, an $850 billion budget to an organization that can't pass an audit and tell you where that money went, like, I think most people would consider that somewhere in the realm of waste, fraud, or abuse because they would wonder why that money isn't well accounted for. Cool, so far we've covered regulatory and financial capture in the educational system. Now let's take a look at taxation. Most people don't know this, but most universities, both public and private, file as 501c3 tax-exempt organizations, giving them quasi-monopolistic powers of paying no taxes unless they want to and facing very little to no regulation. More on that in a second. Remember, student debt is the one debt you can't file bankruptcy for. So what's a high school kid to do? You scramble to get into the best school that you can, you put yourself $200,000 in the hole, and you just hope and pray that the job market pays you back so that this debt that's amassing interest at a higher for longer rate right now uh, doesn't follow you to your grave. And why can't you ditch that debt? Because the government, Sally Mae, is the gatekeeper for that debt and they just decided not to play by the same rules of capitalism and take that L like a traditional lender would. Oh, but the plot thickens. These same universities have multi-billion dollar endowments that they pay no taxes on and face little to no regulation on how much they can continue to increase the cost of tuition. After all, the government benefits from inescapable debt, so it's not in their interest to cap tuition costs. Now think of all that ticket money from football games, from basketball tournaments, from merch, from the bookstore even, that we all know is like a scam within a scam, right? No taxes. But here's the real kicker. They're not even taxed on their real estate or even on their investment income. To be fair, some universities do make pilot payments. That just stands for payment in lieu of taxes. Yale's an example of this. They pay money back to the host city of New Haven, Connecticut, but clearly not enough to make it a safe place. I will say the pizza at Sally's and Modern is arguably worth risking your life for. But here's a few examples of universities with massive multi-billion dollar endowments that still get tons and tons of federal and state funding, tax-free. Let's go back to Yale for a second. Yale's endowment is $41.4 billion and they still got $669 million in 2021 in government funding and an additional undisclosed amount from the state of Connecticut. You got Harvard's endowment at the top of the list, $49.4 billion, Stanford, $36.3 billion, 
Columbia University, $13.3 billion, but still managed to snag $80 million in government funding. Now this one blows my mind. John Hopkins, with their mere $8.2 billion endowment, still managed to get almost $3 billion, $2.9 billion in 2019 alone in government funding. And this will blow your mind. Let me give you a little bit of context just so you can compare these big cash balances, these endowments, to some of our most successful corporations in the US. How much cash are they sitting on? We've got Meta at 54.8 billion, Pfizer 51.3 billion, Anthem 38.9 billion, GM 38.4 billion, Coca-Cola 36.2, 36 for Ford, Intel 35.6. Look at Meta and Pfizer. I mean, they're right on par with Harvard. They're sitting on all that cash, and yet the difference is, is they have to compete, whereas Harvard can just have this tax-exempt situation and also hoard the knowledge. So let me ask you guys, just feel free to sound off in the comments. Do you think that some of these universities that have say 10, 20, 30, 40, or in Harvard's case, 50 plus billion dollars in a cash balance just sitting there in an endowment, do you think that maybe they should be scrutinized just a little bit more like a regular corporation should be uh, in, in terms of adding value back? I mean, after all, the reason that they get to skate through these tax-free exemptions is because they're supposed to be adding back to society. But if you look at the acceptance rate for some of these universities, I mean, how much uh, are they really adding back to the greater society versus just an elite few? I think that's the question. I think it's a fair question. Let me know what you think down below. Okay, enough about what's wrong with the world. Let's talk about alternatives and the best path forward. After all, many corporations have recently announced that they no longer require a degree. Google's a great example of that. And you also have to wonder what AI is gonna to bring to education in the near future. But first, let's follow the lead of our famous college dropouts and Elon and apply some of this first principles thinking to see if we can come up with better solutions for how to educate in the future. We're gonna question everything and delete, delete, delete. Number one, how much should this really cost? Room, board, books? Let's get down to the actual cost of things. Just to kick it off with an interesting stat, the average cost of an in-person calculus course is 2,500 bucks versus $400 online. That's a huge gap. How long does it really take to get this education? I mean, four years is the standard. Is that outdated? It seems pretty onerous given all the technological advances that we've experienced in just a short period of time. Just speaking for myself, I could not wait to get out of high school. And then when I got to college, I couldn't wait to get out of college. I basically was able to get all A's and at Northeastern University, you know, in the bean pot with Harvard, if you were on the honors program, you could overload your classes. You could basically say, I'm gonna take on as much schoolwork as possible. I was able to do that and cut out an entire year just because I wanted to get out there. It's like, let me add it already. That's also another way to save some money. I mean, I cut out the cost of all that too. And, and for some of these extra years, I mean, how much is that serving the university in cost versus actually serving you? And just the bigger meta question of, you know, are you better off going to college? You know, how long is it gonna take for you to see a return on that investment? Most people say what they get out of the deal is status, uh, legacy, you know, if your, your parents went to a certain school, uh, you want to network. And a lot of people are just doing it as a safety plan because society told them that they had to. Also, who's the best in education right now that we can learn from? A lot of people point to Finland. Now, if you're looking to be a lawyer or a doctor or even some forms of engineering, clearly you need to go through the formal training. But for most business students, I think you will learn so much more if you took it upon yourself, say in high school or took a gap year before college and just gamble 10, 20, even $30,000 on a side project startup to see if you can get some current revenue going, I think that's gonna teach you so much more about how business works than sitting in a class and trying to soak in all these abstract concepts before you have like an actual lattice to attach it to of, uh, you know, firsthand experience. So yeah, gambling $20,000 on a startup idea or maybe some other courses or a trade or vocation, uh, I think that's a lot wiser to get a feel for what you actually like and are connected to before you make that huge leap of $200,000 of debt. You know, you can always do that after the fact. Traditional schools taught you how to memorize. I mean, I spent so much time memorizing things that I don't even use to this day. And Google came along and just completely eradicated the need to do that. And yeah, school teaches you to show up on time and meet homework assignments and work with other people. Uh, you know, a lot of things do that in life. You don't need four years and $200,000 of debt just to get those skills. And of course, then there's YouTube. And YouTube will teach you how to do anything from fix a carburetor to learn how to code. And this is where I think there's a huge opportunity to transform how we approach education. 
See, all the information's out there, but the problem is, is that it's incumbent upon you to want to learn. It's incumbent upon you to find that information, to also to be able to recognize what quality information looks like, and then to be able to get into a group with other peers to be able to trade ideas and build upon that knowledge, and then also to be able to funnel it into you know, building an enterprise and building a company that you can actually make a living on. So all the information is out there. You can learn anything if you really want to. It's freely available on YouTube, Google, OpenAI, or even the library. Uh, but there's a real need for a mechanism to organize this information and then build consensus for these online lessons for what's most important, what's accurate, and what's most demand in the market. And then you gotta channel that into communities so people can meet, learn from one another, and then maybe eventually build companies together. Now, speaking of which, I just completed Harvard's CS50 Python course. It's considered world-class and it's completely free. If you wanna see what a great professor looks like, look at Dr. David Malin. It takes 16 hours, but really more like 35 to 40 hours because you have to stop and work with it. But here's the thing, it's out there. You might not know about it. It's got a lot of views, but not the amount of views it should have for being entirely free and from being from a a, a university that charges you $90,000 to go there per year. And here's the thing, you don't have to wait to be 18 years old to find it, it's out there. See, Harvard's not all that bad. And over the next two weeks, I'm gonna audit one of Harvard's finance and economic courses, also free. Point being is that we're living in a one-to-many world right now. And a lot of the elite universities are catching on. You can get free courses from MIT, Harvard, and a lot of the other Ivies, or just other schools that you might be interested in. You just gotta wanna do it, and somebody has to give you the heads up. By the way, it might sound a little intimidating, but there's also corresponding Discord servers, so that if you have questions as you're going through it, you could just drop a question in there and immediately somebody gets back to you. And already you're networking with people within the field before you even finish the class. This was also a key component to Elon's Ad Astra School. He didn't segment the students by age. Everybody was in the same classroom learning from one another. Coincidentally, I found another novel approach by Elon Musk's co-founder at PayPal, Peter Thiel. He has what's called the Thiel Fellowship. It's not perfect, but some huge names have come out of it, including Vitalik Buterin of Ethereum fame. The deal there is you get $100,000 over two years. You can't be in college, if you are you have to quit, and you have to be 22 or younger. And even if you're pre-product, but you have a concrete idea that you're working on, you can apply. And over the last couple of years I've heard people trying to build consensus for this other idea which I think is really predatory and I want to caution you guys to look out for it. Some wealthy folks are basically trying to create a program where they'll sponsor somebody's education in return for uh, essentially a royalty on all their future earnings. So say like, you know, I front you the $200,000 and then I'm entitled to 10% of everything you earn going forward. To me, that is gross, predatory. If you're in a position to front somebody $200,000, donate it to a tax-free organization, um, do it out of the kindness of your heart, but you know, really don't put somebody under your boot uh, for the rest of their lives. I think that's gross. Guys, if any of this piques your interest, there's a whole nother rabbit hole you can go down, uh, which I'm essentially just digging myself out of to bring you this video. And it's that guy named Josh Don. He's the fourth grade teacher that Elon recruited for his, his personal private school. And he has since started other companies, um, Astra Novia, and, uh, and other things. And the way he thinks about you know, the future of education is brilliant. Um, it's, it's putting students in control. It's, 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 it's creating simulations and games so that they have an emotional connection to the learning. I think that's, that's paramount to, uh, to, to the next generation of education. And I think his goal is to make this eventually free. And if freewheeling it is not really for you, there's a lot more structured online classes that you could find, say like Class Dojo or Udemy or even like Code Academy. You know, these, these places will give you some exposure to find out if, if that's even what you really wanna do before you go and incur all this debt. That's possible now in a way where it wasn't 50 years ago. And the last thing I am is anti-education. I owe a ton to my education. I read at least 60 books a year. I'm constantly consuming stuff and YouTube and, and just more structured courses. Uh, but I, I think it's impossible to uh, turn a blind eye to all this ideological, financial, and tax-related capture that's going on in the American school system uh, and even at the elite institutions. But on a brighter note, these more entrepreneurial-based offerings give me a ton of hope. Because remember, at the end of the day, there's only two ways to undo this massive $33.5 trillion of U.S. debt. Innovation and austerity. One of these is way more fun than the other. What will you choose? All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'll see you next week. And until then, be kind to one another. Violence is definitely not the move.